Thank you for inviting me to participate in this panel, albeit now virtually. I'm going to begin my remarks by defining killer acquisitions, and then I'm going to briefly review the findings of my paper, Killer Acquisitions, co-authored with Florian Edorer and Song Ma. Then I will speak to some of the most common questions that come up when discussing killer acquisitions that are relevant in the context of broader merger activity and policy. So first, let me begin by defining what a killer acquisition is because the term has started to be thrown around quite loosely since my co-authors and I first named and analyzed the phenomena. So in our paper, we, in which we provide the first theoretical analysis and empirical investigation of the phenomena, we define it as the acquisition of a target firm and the subsequent termination of the target's innovations to preempt future competition. In our paper, we also provide systematic evidence of the existence and prevalence of this phenomena of killer acquisitions. To do so, we combine novel theory with large-scale empirical evidence, which uses data from about 16,000 drug development projects in the pharmaceutical sector. We make a key delineation using the drug development data. We use the target project disease and mechanism of action of the drug project to group projects into markets. We then use this to separate out acquirers who have projects who would likely directly compete with the target's projects which we call competing or overlapping acquirers from other acquirers who don't have potentially competing products. We, then use, we also use these uh, market delineations to measure existing competition in the market for the, for the drug project. Uh, in our analysis, we compare drug projects acquired by firms with competing projects to otherwise similar projects acquired by firms without competing projects and otherwise similar, uh, similar non-acquired projects. We find that incumbents are four, are four times more likely to acquire pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical projects that threaten to develop into potentially directly compete, competing drugs than otherwise similar uh, targets. Second, they are twice more likely to discontinue or kill these projects. And uh, we find that these effects are concentrated in already less competitive markets. We also document that many of these acquisitions occur just below the pre-market notification thresholds. And overall, we estimate around 6% of all acquisitions are killer acquisitions, or they're about uh, 50 per year. In our analyses, we test for a long list of alternative explanations for acquisitions and project termination, including technology or knowledge acquisitions, human capital acquisitions, or so-called acquihires, uh, salvage acquisitions, whether it's driven by optimal product uh, selection in multi-project targets, markets for lemons, et cetera, but we find no empirical support in our data for these alternative explanations. We also find no evidence for efficiency gains of, of acquisitions overall. Acquired drug projects of all types are less likely to be developed than non-acquired projects. And this is in line uh, with uh, prior evidence by Blongin and Pierce, who find that uh, M&As across the US economy are associated with increases in average markups, but they find little evidence of efficiency or, product or productivity gains. One important fact to point out is that killer acquisitions are in the interest of both the acquirer and the target company. The acquirer protects the market for its existing branded drug and the target company receives a payment in return for the acquisition. However, it's likely that consumers lose out on variety, quality, and in terms of lower prices. Okay, so now I'll go through a few questions that tend to come up around the subject of killer acquisition. So the first question is, what is the difference between a killer and a nascent acquisition? A killer acquisition is uh, the acquisition of a project of a potential uh, a competitor, which is acquired and then killed. And the product is either in very early stages or still pre-market. Uh, comparatively, a nascent acquisition is, a, is, is again an acquisition of a potential com a competitor, but it's not necessarily killed. Uh, the product, again, is either in very early stages or still pre-market. So in some sense, you can think of killer acquisitions as a special or particularly malicious or extreme case of a nascent acquisition, um, but not all nascent acquisitions are killer acquisitions. However, even when firms acquire nascent competitors and do not completely kill off the target's invention, such acquisitions may still have anti-competitive effects, which others have pointed to. For instance, the acquire my slow, stall, pause, or shelve development are the, of the target's project rather than completely terminate it. 
um, the target's innovation. If the target's innovation is already on the market, the acquirer may degrade its quality or just sort of slow down improvement of it. They may uh, curtail current and future development of their own related technologies, which Kafar, Crawford, and Valetti have now called reverse killer acquisitions. Um, Tom Woolman has also highlighted the issue of stealth consolidation, whereby small anti-competitive deals avoid antitrust scrutiny because of their size, but they may have large cumulative effects. So in some, not all acquisitions are killer acquisitions, not all nascent acquisitions are killer acquisitions. However, nascent acquisitions that aren't killer acquisitions can still be anti-competitive. A uh, second question is, what are the key challenges that arise in examining killer acquisitions? So the largest challenge in trying to study and prove killer acquisitions is that we never observe the counterfactual. That is, what would have happened to the nascent technology or, or product uh, if it wasn't acquired? In our analysis, we study this behavior at an aggregate level by comparing projects uh, acquired by firms with competing projects with two control groups, two counterfactual groups, otherwise similar projects acquired by firms without competing projects and otherwise similar projects that aren't acquired. And then we also do these supplementary analyses to eliminate alternative explanations for our findings, which I mentioned earlier. On a case-by-case -case basis, it's more difficult to refute claims that the project just didn't work and so it was shelved when in fact it was intentionally killed. Um, in the case of Malengrat's acquisition of the U.S. development rights of uh, Synactin, which is discussed in our paper and also in the OECD backgrounder paper, um, development and approval in other countries provided such a counterfactual. Uh, unfortunately, for identification purposes, at least not every case is as obvious as this. So a valid counterfactual is really the largest challenge when uh, trying to examine killer acquisitions. A third question, is pharma special, um, which pharma is the subject of our paper, or are these concerns likely relevant beyond pharma? The short answer to that is yes and yes. Yes, pharma is special, and yes, these concerns are probably likely to be relevant beyond just pharmaceuticals. So every time myself or my co-authors talk about our killer acquisitions paper, people ask us, what about tech? Uh, our research focuses on pharmaceuticals mainly for methodological reasons. We can see uh, projects at the project level from initiation. We can follow them before and after acquisition, and we can get relatively clear market delineations, and hence we can measure and identify potentially competing acquirers and existing market competition. So pharma also has some other features that make it special. Um, so it has strong IP protection, so buying a patent is going to really shut down the potential competitor, which would likely be less true in tech, where IP is typically not as well protected. Aquahires are relatively rare in pharma and are thought to be more frequent in tech. So this might explain um, some of the post-acquisition project terminations in the tech space. However, uh, Aqua hires themselves could be a, 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 com a competition concern. Um, the greater data availability that allows us to, has allowed us to conduct the analysis that we've done in our paper in Farmer also means that identifying nascent competitive threats is easier in general in Pharma than potentially in tech. You also don't get this business model pivoting so that the technology can be used and repurposed in a different way. So it's just easier to identify potential competing firms in this space. Yet, uh, we all know of anecdotes of tech companies buying firms with related products, services, or technologies, and then shortly after closing down these products or products are mothballing them. And so uh, are these concerns likely relevant? Yes. Uh, final question. What about relevant dynamic efficiencies? Or in other words, what are the sort of welfare uh, consequences of killer acquisitions? Are they all bad? I think the negative consequences of killer acquisitions, at least ex post, are pretty clear in terms of decrease, decreased competition. So loss of variety, higher prices, et cetera. Um, there's two sort of standard counter arguments that to the idea that this is a uh, negative has ne that killer acquisitions have negative welfare consequences. The first is that it avoids the duplication of research research effort and development costs. 
Um, however, killer acquisitions never occur where there already exists relatively healthy competition, and hence there's little uh, duplication of research effort that's really to be avoided through killer acquisitions. Um, the second counter argument, a, a fairly big one, is that the prospect of killer acquisitions or nascent acquisitions leads to more ex ante innovation by new entrepreneurs or by existing incumbents. Um, however, some recent evidence speaks to this. So first, at a broad level, a paper by Hocup and co-authors provides evidence that farmer, farmer mergers have a negative effect on R&D efforts overall, not just for the merging parties, but also for competing incumbents as well as new entrants. Uh, second, a recent paper on the kill zone phenomena provides empirical evidence that a kill zone is actually created by the acquisitions of tech giants in the tech space. That is, rather than acquisition activity in, in a particular market, creating additional entrepreneurial incentives, VCs significantly reduce the number of deals and the amount of money they invest in markets where uh, Facebook and Google have previously made acquisitions. Uh, and finally, even if killer acquisitions did, in, did stimulate ex ante innovation, economic theory suggests that innovation efforts would be directed to more to just innovations in order to be acquired rather than more novel, more original, and potentially disruptive innovations. So that's it from me. Thanks very much again for the chance to participate in this panel. Mm -hmm.